Hi, my name's Ryan. Today, I want to talk with you about how to approach interviews for networking positions. So why am I making this video? I do lots of interviews for my current company, spend lots of time writing feedback that other interviewers and hiring managers read, and talk to a lot of candidates about their interview experiences. Basically, I'm very interested in the hiring process from both sides of the interview table and want to provide an interview where both parties come away feeling like they had a good experience. As an interviewer, my primary goal is to assess whether you'll be able to fill the role. If I'm talking with you, that means that someone else has already decided you might be a good fit. My job is to confirm that and support myself with evidence. I want you to do well. I'm just here to collect data about you and then use that data to make the right choice. Unfortunately, I interact with a lot of candidates that make collecting data difficult. Even worse, the mistakes these candidates make aren't unique. Most of them are extremely common, and some are built around misconceptions about parts of the hiring process. My goal is to point out these common mistakes and provide some other tips to make your life and your interviewer's life easier. By the time you finish this video, I hope you'll have a slightly different perspective on the hiring process. Do remember that every interview is different. Companies change their hiring practices over time, and some companies are more rigorous about their hiring than others. Take my advice as nothing more than advice. I'll fully admit my exposure to interviews has been mostly limited to larger companies, but I believe the same pieces of advice will apply to most other interviews. Before I begin, let me provide a little more information about myself. I've been in the networking field for a little over a decade now and have been involved in hiring for most of that. My initial job was to shadow while another interviewer asked the questions, but after about a year of that I started asking questions and conducting my own interviews. My experience with hiring has been for some pretty large companies, and I've applied to positions at other large companies. The general structure of the hiring process seems extremely consistent, and after seeing some of the quirks of individual companies, I feel I have a good grasp on the common pitfalls and practices. I spend a lot of time interviewing because I want to have good coworkers. I also spent a lot of time helping other interviewers get more comfortable with the process. I want to pass on all of the stuff I've seen. Educating others is something I enjoy. In a lot of ways, that education is more important than my day-to-day -day work. If you want to know more about me, have a look at my LinkedIn profile. I've placed a link in the video's description. Enough about me, let's get on to the important stuff. I'm going to go over each major part of the hiring process. In my experience, this process can be divided into three major parts. First, someone will look at your resume to see if you might be a viable candidate. Second, you'll talk on the phone with someone to see if you're a good candidate. Finally, you'll talk with someone in person, giving them a chance to get to know you and assess directly whether you're a good fit for the role. Each of these steps has its own set of pitfalls, so I want to break down the answers to three major questions for each. What's the goal of this step from the hiring company's perspective? What is the hiring company looking for and why? Answering this question is extremely important because it plays into the next two questions. What things should candidates do to make this step go smoothly? The items mentioned here are going to correspond directly with the reasons for the step. Finally, what things should candidates not do during this step? Most of the points I list here are going to be based on prior experiences but they will all tie into the goals for the step. All right, let's dive in. First, let's talk about the resume review process. What's the point of reviewing resumes? A resume provides interested parties with a snapshot of who you are, what you've done, and what you want to do. At its core, that's what a resume is. Recruiters and hiring managers are looking at your resume to try to answer three basic questions. Do you meet the minimum qualifications? Do you have work experience that's relevant for the job? And do your goals align with the company's goals for the job? If the answer is yes to all three of these questions, then you're probably a good fit for the role and things will progress. If the answer is unclear, a hiring manager or recruiter will be hard pressed to expend more time or effort on you as a candidate. Your resume is very likely to be your first impression on the reader so it also gives them a sense for whether you can effectively communicate in writing. This may be more or less important for some specific roles, but it is an important soft skill for any employee. So given those points, what can you do to make your resume appealing? 
First, make sure your resume is small enough to be easily read in a short amount of time. As a rule, you should never have a resume longer than two sides of a page. This is supposed to be a snapshot, not your life story. If you find your resume getting longer than necessary, you may want to look at removing things that aren't relevant to the specific role you're applying for. Second, your resume should tell the reader what specific things you've done in the past that are relevant to the role. That word relevant is the key. If you're applying for a role where you'll strictly be doing cabling between devices, the hiring manager probably doesn't care about your prior experience with MPLS. Everything on your resume should be relevant. Your resume should be immaculate. Since this is your first impression on the reader, you want to leave a good one. Have lots of people proofread your resume, make sure it's easy to read by a non-technical person, and be consistent in the style and layout you use. For example, if you provide starting and ending dates in one section, use the same format in other sections. Finally, remember that your resume is the first chance to send a message to the reader. The reader will want to make sure your goals align with the goals for the role, so make sure your goals are clear. The easiest way to do this is with an objective statement at the beginning of your resume. Make sure you tailor your objective statement to each role you apply for. Now let's tackle the other side. What should you avoid doing? The most common mistake I see is candidates listing every technology or protocol they've ever touched. I'm guessing this is an attempt to try to influence companies that run resumes against keyword matching. Listing a protocol doesn't tell the reader of your resume how you've used it. If you want to mention something, work it into your work experience so the reader has context. Similarly, don't put something on your resume you would be uncomfortable talking about in person in depth. I see this extremely often with programming languages that candidates used in college. If you haven't touched Java since you got your bachelor's degree 10 years ago, don't put it on your resume. Don't try to tell the reader your life story. While your work experience has shaped you, it's very unlikely that it's all relevant to the role at hand. Most people will only be able to talk in detail about jobs from the past 10 to 15 years, so listing jobs before that point is probably wasting space. Keep the descriptions of your jobs relevant to the role as well. Don't leave anything to the reader's imagination. It's extremely common for me to find resumes where dates aren't listed for certifications, or where the descriptions for previous jobs don't tell me much about the candidate's day to day. Your goal should be to paint a clear picture about who you are and what you've done, so make sure your resume reflects that. This is sort of a pet peeve, but I hate resumes that end with references available upon request. A company will either want references or it won't. For most IT positions, references aren't needed. We care more about what you're capable of in the interview itself. My advice is to leave the statement and your references off your resume. Finally, don't let your resume be generic. Make sure you're tailoring it before you submit it for a role. I can't tell you the number of resumes I've seen with objective statements like, to enhance my educational and professional skills in a stable and dynamic workplace. That doesn't tell me anything about what you want to do with your career. To summarize, Keep your resume short, relevant, and specific. I could probably do an entire video on making a good resume. Put some time into your resume, get lots of feedback, and continue to improve it. Your future self will thank you. So your resume looks good, and now the company wants to chat with you to find out more about you. What's the point of a phone screen? At a high level, a phone screen lets the interviewer confirm that you, the candidate, can do the job. That's the point of the interview process, after all. Different companies will use phone screens in different ways, but very few skip this step. In some cases, the phone screen may even be the final step in the interview process. Typically, phone screens are used to confirm that you have at least a basic understanding of the required technologies or protocols relevant to the role. Some interviewers will ask trivia questions, but I prefer to ask questions that require candidates to understand the underlying technology. A phone screen is your chance to add more context about your prior roles. It's nearly impossible to fit all of the details about a prior role into your resume. Interviewers will probably have questions about the specifics of your role, and this is their chance to fill in those gaps. A phone screen may also be your first opportunity to ask about the role and the company. No candidate wants to walk into a role without knowing the specifics, and asking questions shows interviewers that you're interested in what you might be doing not just the paycheck. 
As with your resume, talking with someone on the phone is going to give that person an impression of how effective you are at verbal communication. Knowing a lot means nothing if you can't communicate it. And again, this is an extremely important soft skill. So what can you do to ensure your phone screen goes well? First, take some time to prepare before your phone screen. There are lots of things you can do to set yourself up for success before the phone screen starts. Make sure you're in a suitable environment with minimal background noise and distractions. If you can, test the audio quality before your phone screen starts. If you have a phone with poor audio quality, it may be worth doing the phone screen from a computer with a headset. Try to think of some specific scenarios you can talk about at length. You may want to have a sticky note with a short summary of the scenarios and some details about each. This will save you from needing to try to remember details under pressure. If you have questions, write them down so you can remember to ask them. Have a pen and paper ready so you can jot down answers or other questions you might think of during the phone screen. During the phone screen, be honest with your interviewer about what you do or don't know. If you've taken my advice and put some thought into your resume, you shouldn't end up with questions on unfamiliar topics. If you do, it's very likely the position isn't a good fit for your current skill set. If you make assumptions, make sure you state them. Most candidates on a phone screen are nervous and tend to ramble a bit when asked questions. Try to focus on answering the question the interviewer asked and don't provide excessive amounts of information when answering. They only have a limited amount of time to talk with you, so make every second count. If you can, write down each question when you're asked and reread the question every so often to make sure you're not going off the rails. Your interviewer may inadvertently make some assumptions about things you do or don't know. If this happens, make sure you ask some clarifying questions to see what the interviewer is getting at. From an interviewer's perspective, asking relevant, clarifying questions is always a good thing because it shows me you understand what pieces of information might be missing. What should you avoid doing during a phone screen? Don't try to tell the story of your entire work history up to that point. Most of the time, your interviewer is less interested in how you got here and more interested in your accomplishments and abilities. While it might be tempting to take notes on a computer keyboard, your interviewer has almost no way to know if you're using your computer to search for answers. Actually using a search engine during an interview is even worse. I've been on the other end of a few interviews where this has happened, and it's almost always obvious to the interviewer. The long pauses after questions and shallow responses that are filled with the right terms but no depth are both dead giveaways. I recommend not telling interviewers more than they want to hear unless your response is directly relevant to their question. Again, they only have a limited amount of time to assess you, and any additional time you take is less time they have to ask clarifying questions or move on to more advanced topics. Most companies I've interviewed for require that we not provide direct feedback to the candidate during an interview. Regardless of the company's policy, don't ask if you got a question right. It shows the interviewer that you're more interested in being right than showing what you know. If I'm asking you questions and you aren't confident about your answers, I'm going to reconsider your depth of knowledge and responses. Finally, I realize that nobody knows everything. That says the response, I just Google it, is never a good idea. Have the confidence to admit that you're not familiar with what the interviewer is asking. And if you want to mention searching, tell them what you'd be searching for. Telling me what keywords you think are relevant and what sorts of things you'd look for in search results is much more valuable. To summarize, focus on providing your interviewer with clear, direct responses to the questions they ask and make sure to ask questions of your own. Never forget that interviewing is a two-way street. You are assessing the company and role just as much as the company is assessing your fitness for the role. Let's say you leave a positive impression on the person who conducted your phone screen and the company wants to bring you in for an interview on site or via video chat. So what's the point of an on-site interview? On-sites give interviewers a chance to ask more in-depth questions than are possible on a phone screen. Because you're physically present, technical interviewers will probably use a whiteboard to give you more detailed scenarios. Non-technical interviewers will probably not hand you a whiteboard marker, 
but will be asking many more follow-up questions than they would on a phone screen. In all cases, interviewers are looking at both your body language and your verbal responses. They're interested in your overall reaction to questions you may not know or situations you might not be familiar with. An on-site is a chance for you to meet the sort of people you'd be working with, including the hiring manager. This is an opportunity to see if the way they conduct themselves matches your expectations and to see whether the company's culture is something you're okay with. Finally, this is an opportunity for you to clear up any questions you haven't been able to get answered up to this point. Sometimes your recruiter or phone screener won't have all of the answers, and an on-site should put you in direct contact with all of the people who do. What can you do to ensure your on-site interview goes as well as possible? Since this is the first visual impression your manager or colleagues will have of you, make sure it's a good one. You don't necessarily need to wear a three-piece suit to your interview, but try to ask about dress code in advance and dress one level above what's expected. For example, most folks in my office wear jeans and t-shirts, so dressing in business casual attire would be a step above that. Most of the time, you'll meet with several different people in an on-site. Each person will only have a small amount of time to spend with you, so it's important to let the interviewer ask questions and lead the conversation. That said, you should always ask clarifying questions if you feel you're missing data, and if you make some assumptions in your answers, spell them out. Most of the time, non-technical interviewers will ask situational questions that usually start with, tell me about a time when. When answering these sorts of questions, focus on describing the situation or task, the actions you took, and the results of those actions. Using this method will help keep your answers on track and will provide interviewers with the data they're looking for. As with phone screens, you should have some examples ready before you arrive at your on-site. In technical interviews, make sure your answers are organized and try to avoid hopping from point to point. Take a structured approach to the question, whether that structure be chronological, from the bottom of the OSI model up, or otherwise. If the problem or scenario you're working on has more than one possible approach, make sure you talk about the advantages or disadvantages of your approach versus others. What should you avoid doing during an on-site? As with phone screens, interviewers are usually asked not to provide candidates with direct feedback during the interview, so don't ask if you got something right. My job as an interviewer is to assess you, not teach you or correct you. Don't be late to your interview. Life is crazy sometimes, traffic is often bad, and any number of things could cause you to be late, so plan to arrive to your interview well in advance. My usual strategy is to find a nearby coffee shop and review the job description and any notes I've made. Getting to your interview early will help you feel more in control of things and can do wonders for your confidence during the interview. Don't assume your interviewer has given you all of the information you need to answer a question. Don't dive into a question without clarifying the assumptions you've made. Interviewers are just as interested in the questions you ask as the answers you provide. I've been in too many interviews where candidates have to backtrack and retract previous answers because of data they were missing or assumed. Don't just answer interviewers' questions. Ask some questions of your own. Again, interviewing is a two-way street, and you're assessing the company as much as they're assessing you. My current company will often assign one interviewer as a lunch buddy, whose sole job is to answer questions the candidate might have. Use any opportunity you have to learn as much as you can about the company, the role, the hiring manager, or anything else you feel is missing. Finally, don't come unprepared. Even if you've been in a million interviews before, take the time to research the company, research the role, and brush up on any technical topics you feel will be asked about. The more prepared you are, the less stressed you'll be during the interview. Recruiters will usually try to give you a sense of the structure of the interview and the technical topics you'll be asked about. To summarize, do your best to prepare, ask questions, and clarify assumptions during your on-site. Your goal should be to have a clear picture of the company, role, and hiring manager by the time you leave, and to leave feeling like you've put your best foot forward. Before I end the video, I want to leave you with a few closing thoughts that apply to the interview process as a whole. 
While the structure I've described here is very common in large enterprises, every company handles interviews a bit differently. Smaller companies especially will likely have a lot more flexibility in their hiring process. Do your best to get a feel for the company's interview process from your point of contact. A recruiter's job is to guide you through the process. I'd encourage you to participate in as many interviews as you can as often as you can. Even if you don't think the job will pan out, participating in interviews will help you keep your skills sharp and forces you to focus on technical topics you might not work with every day. If you can, try to become an interviewer. The process of preparing scenarios and questions for candidates provides a great perspective on the interview process and will make you a better candidate. After an interview, let the company know how you felt about the process. Did the interviewer move too fast or ask too many unclear questions? Did the process feel too rushed? Did you see any problematic behaviors during the interview? Let recruiters know what your experience was like so they can improve the interview process for future candidates. Don't forget that the person on the other side of the table is as stressed as you are. Interviewers are stressful for everyone involved. As a candidate, you're trying to put your best foot forward. As an interviewer, you're trying to accurately assess the candidate and only have a limited amount of time. Knowing that the other party is also under pressure helps relieve some of that pressure, I think. Finally, the vast majority of interviewers you encounter want you to do well. I never walk into an interview thinking, I'm going to try to trick this candidate or stump them. I want to get an accurate assessment of you and give you as many opportunities as possible to put your best foot forward. Do everything you can to make that easier. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you walk away from this video with a few new insights on the interview process and wish you all the best in your future interviews.